Welcome everybody to Open Door Church. Uh, it's great to see everybody's smiling faces. It's great to wake up and see the sun this morning. That's a big change for us. Very welcome. Today I'd like to read from uh, from Acts 1 6 11. 1 through 6, 11. So when they came together, they asked the Lord, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for me, for you to know the time and season that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria. And to the end of, and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking upon, upon he was lifted up, and the clouds took him out there, out of their sight. And when they were gazing into the heavens, as they, he went, behold, two men stood by in white robes, and said, "Men of Galilee." Why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you see him go into heaven. Uh, time for short prayer. Dear Lord, my King, thank you for this church and for all the children who have come to honor you. We know we will walk with you again in your time, and we are thankful for that. In the name of our Father. Good morning. So last week, what did we celebrate? You remember? What was Jesus rising from the grave? That's right. So Jesus rose out of the grave, and after he did, where did he go? Where did he go after he rose from the grave? Who knows? In heaven. To heaven. Well, it took a while. It took a while. It was about forty days that he was there with his disciples. And then he went back to heaven. We have a picture of that here in the church. Do you know where it is? Where is it? Do you know where that picture is? Right behind me. And so, isn't that a beautiful picture? So as you see that, what's happening in that picture? Who is there with Jesus in that picture? Can you, can you tell me? Come close to me. So you can tell me, come close, come close. I can't reach. My arms aren't that long. Disciples. Disciples are there. That's right. All the disciples are there. Who else is there? The angels. Where do you see the angels? On the sides where the rocks are. On the sides up there by the clouds. That's right. What else? Do you, who else is there besides the disciples? The Lord. The Lord himself. And he's there lifted up. Who else? Jesus. Jesus. Who else? Mary. Mary's there too. And so we see that in that. And Jesus is rising and he's going back to where? Going back to heaven. And who's up there in heaven waiting for him to get there? Who do you think? God. Who is there? Who is there? God. God's waiting on him. And all the other angels, because there are so many, many angels. And so when we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, we know that he's not here with us now, but he's up there in heaven and he has very special things that he is doing in fact, he's there before God, and the Bible says that whenever we need somebody to talk to God for us, guess who's there to, to talk to God for us? You know who it is? It's Jesus, because he knows all about us, and he loves us and cares for us. So today, today, yeah, <laughs> he can, that's for sure. He can answer our questions before we say them, that's right. So let's pray, just thanking God for Jesus, the fact he rose from the grave, the fact that he went back to heaven to be there for us. Okay? Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for the children. Thank you for what they're learning. I pray, dear God, that they would, each one, understand how wonderful it is to serve a, a risen Savior, but also one who is not only risen from the grave, but one who is there in heaven for us. And so I pray, just asking you'll bless the kids this morning as they go. Bless the teachers who are going to be sharing with them about your truth. And we just ask that you would bless us all this day on this wonderful day. But we pray in Jesus' name. Hope you have your Bibles, and if you have them, open them, if you would, to the 26th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. I want to take you back to that day before the time before Jesus was crucified. It's a sad thing that a betrayer would have so much a part of the story of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to begin talking about Him for just a moment. In Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 14, the Scripture says, Then one of the twelve, named Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me to betray Him to you? And they weighed out thirty pieces of silver. From then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. Notice, if you would, that word, then. Then, one of the twelve. We learned Sunday, we looked at this, and we learned that Judas had protested against the extravagant act of Mary as Mary had taken that very costly ointment and poured it out on Jesus' head. He had protested, but his protest had been ignored. It's John who provides insight into the heart of this traitorous disciple, for he writes in John chapter 12 and verse 6 and says, Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. And so as we look at Judas, we know that betrayal was already in his heart. In fact, he had consistently betrayed the trust that was given to him by the other disciples, the Word of God telling us that he was stealing from the money that was entrusted to him. And so now we see clearly why Judas was so angered at what he considered to be a waste of expensive perfume. It was not for the poor that he was concerned now, can you imagine one so selfish that he would embezzle funds that were entrusted to him that was for the provision of food for his companions? Can you imagine being so greedy as to take opportunity to betray the Lord Jesus who had shown him nothing but love? And yet we read in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, where the Word of God says the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? A few days passed after Judas made his bargain with the chief priest. And then we learned that at the Passover meal, Jesus indicated that one of the disciples would betray him. And at first, Judas must have been startled, but instead he maintains his outward composure as he chooses to believe that Jesus is only guessing that maybe Jesus is giving in to a bit of paranoia. And so he decides the, to put on his best acting job and imitates the response of the other 11 disciples, and he says, surely it is not I, Rabbi. But we know that his hypocrisy falls short. The others had asked, surely not I, Lord. He refers to him as Rabbi or teacher, and then Jesus responded to his hypocrisy, you have said it yourself. What did he mean by that? Well, he's saying that the way you have asked the question is admission to the act itself. You see, Jesus, Jesus could hear in Judas' choice of words an admission 
to his guilt. He, of course, could see into Judas's heart and see that there was betrayal. Listen to John's account of what happened next. In John chapter 13, verses 27 to 30, it says, After the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. Now no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. For some were supposing, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, Buy the things we have need of for the feast or else that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. Now Judas has gone out into the night. He has gone out with his heart full of anger. He is at this time fully and completely yielded to the evil one. Now in his absence, we know that the Lord broke bread and drank of the fruit of the vine with the other disciples, giving them a way to remember him. Later, after Jesus endured the lonely agony and complete surrender of Gethsemane, as recorded in Matthew chapter 26, verse 46, he says, Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Indeed, we find that they did not have to wait long because Judas knew exactly where he might find them. Verse 47 says, While he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs who came from the chief priest and elders of the people. Judas, that name today is synonymous with one who betrays a close friend. Yet would you believe that there are those who would argue that Judas was simply doing what God intended for him to do and thus that he should not be held accountable? I mean, somebody had to do this. Somebody had to be the betrayer. The Scripture said it would happen. Somebody had to do it, and it was poor Judas that was called upon to do such a thing. But listen again, if you would, to verse 24 in this chapter. For Jesus said, But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. No allowance here for such a statement as that. No allowance here in the words of Jesus for anybody excusing Judas for what he has done. Certainly it was predicted. Certainly this was known by God. But he was fully accountable for his betrayal, fully accountable for what he did. Peter would later describe Jesus in his message on the day of Pentecost as being this man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. And then he said, This man you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. So on the one hand, we find Peter saying also, that it was all part of the plan of God, that this was something foreknown by God, that this was something that definitely was going to happen. And yet, Peter speaks to them and says, you are the ones who took him and crucified him. Listen to verse 54. Jesus asked, How then will the Scriptures be fulfilled which say that it must happen this way? So even though Judas and those who cried out for the death of Jesus will be held totally responsible for their actions, Jesus said it must happen this way. So let's see if we can understand why that was true tonight. Let me first point out that it must happen this way for Jesus is the one who is the great I Am. Listen to John chapter 18 beginning in verse 3. It says, Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priest and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am he. And Judas also who was betraying him, was standing with them. Now I want you to get this picture. 
because there was a calmness about Jesus, a calmness that was disarming to the Roman soldiers. After all, think about it. They have come to arrest the leader of a rebel gang, or so they thought. They have come to arrest one who has been accused of threatening to overthrow the Roman government. And yet, when they come and they find him, Jesus doesn't even wait until they come to him. He went forth to them and asked, Whom do you seek? Of course he knew. And they answered, Jesus the Nazarene. And he replied, I am. In the original Greek, ego I me, which means I, even I am. Now for the Roman soldiers, their training told them that something was wrong. Jesus was too calm. It must be that what had happened was that they had walked into a trap. After all, Jesus had many followers... He had not tried to escape. Even though the chief priests and Pharisees had warned them of how slippery that Jesus could be. After all, on more than one occasion, they had thought that Jesus was going to be stoned to death by the crowds, but each time He had escaped them. And so I am sure that they had warned the soldiers that they better be on guard because Jesus would not be easy to capture. And instead of that, he approaches them and he readily admits his identity. And so we read in verse 6, So when he came to them, when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now what is this talking about? What took place here? Well, the Roman soldiers, sensing that something was wrong, they dropped back into a defensive position, fearing that they are about to be overwhelmed by the followers of the Lord Jesus. When it says they fell back, that means they fell back with their, with their spears out uh, in a circle so that if the enemy were to attack them, that they are ready. They are in a defensive position. Now, can you imagine how foolish they looked? A multitude against twelve. And yet they fall back in fear when he boldly admits his identity. Well, we know that they were, in fact, foolish. They had come with lanterns and torches to find the one who had proclaimed, I am the light of the world. They had come with weapons against the one who was proclaimed to be the king of peace. They had responded in fear to the one who called himself and was referred to by John the Baptist as the Lamb of God. And all he had to do was to say those two words, Ego I me, I, even I am. Now you know that those two words, I am, were not just an admission of his identity. They were a proclamation of who he was. Jesus often described himself, he often talked about the fact of who he was by saying, I am, identifying himself completely and totally with Jehovah God who told Moses, tell them, I am has sent you. The Holy God, Jesus said, I am. They're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. I am. You see, it must happen this way. For Jesus is, in fact, the great I am. For only God the Son, only the one who is fully God and fully man, could pay the price for man's sin. God's justice demanded that the price be death. God's love and mercy demanded that the price be paid by a sinless one, and there is only one without sin, and that is God Himself. It must happen this way, because Jesus is the great I Am. Look further in the text, for I want you to notice that it must happen this way, for Jesus is the one that we call the friend of sinners. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 48 through 50, it says this, Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. 
Immediately Judas went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. This must have been somewhat disarming for Judas as Jesus addresses him as friend. He doesn't refer to him as his enemy. He doesn't refer to him as a devil, but instead he calls him a friend. Now you will remember that Jesus was often accused by his enemies as being a friend of publicans and sinners. You're also familiar with the statement that Jesus made in John chapter 15 verse 13, where he says, Greater love has no man than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Now, it's interesting to note that the word that Jesus used in speaking to Judas was a different word. When Jesus was accused of being a friend of publicans and sinners, the word was phylos, meaning a dear friend. Also, when he, was acu- when he demonstrated his love for us, he was laying down his life for his dear friends. But that word, the word that we would use for a dear friend, was not the word he used toward Judas. He is addressed merely as companion or as comrade, not as dear friend. It is still a good word. It still means friend. And it is still a remarkable thing that this one, who is in the very act of betraying our Lord, could be, addr- could be addressed as anything other than a coward, a turncoat, or an enemy. We know that Jesus has proven to be our dear friend. He did for us what our closest friends would never do and could never do. What did He do? He suffered the death penalty for us in order that you and I might have eternal life, that we might be able to live forever. You see, what took place with the crucifixion of Jesus must happen the way that it happened because Jesus is the friend of sinners. Our dear friend. One who would lay down His life for us. I want to say also that it must happen this way For Jesus is the very Son of God. Look at verse 51. It says, And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and He will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? Did you hear Him? All He had to do was simply ask His Father, and twelve legions of angels would have come to His rescue. Now, how many is twelve legions? That is more than 72,000 angels. Now, since one angel in the Old Testament, it says that one angel killed 185,000 of Sennacherib's army in a single night, Now that is a pretty awesome force to think that you have 72,000 of such angels that would immediately come to His rescue and all He had to do was ask. The Father would have dispensed them at the blink of an eye. Jesus said, do I need for you to defend me? Do you need to step in the way? No. All I have to do, I'm not defenseless. All I have to do is ask my Father. But Jesus, we know, did not appeal to His Father. You see, it had to happen this way. Jesus had to lay down His life voluntarily because all the armies of the earth could not have taken His life from Him. He told us, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own will. No man, no army could have taken it from him. He didn't need Peter's protection. He does not need our sympathy for what he did. It must happen this way. And you see, he did it of his own free will. A few moments ago, we read together out of Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Let me read it to you again. Listen to what it says. 
Paul writes and says, "...have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although, listen, he although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But instead he emptied himself." taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Here the one is, Paul says, he says, I want you to understand who this Jesus is. Now you need to have this same type of attitude in yourself. Here he was, he was God the Son. Here he was, equal with the Father. But he was willing to lay all of that aside in order that he might come here and take upon himself the form of a man so that he might become a sacrifice for us. So that he would be obedient even to the point of death on a cross. You see, He was and is the Son of God who left heaven to become the Son of Man. Jesus said that it must happen this way because it was the plan of God that He be the one who would be the payment for sin. That payment could only be made by one who had no sin of his own. Only Jesus, the eternal Son of God, could pay that price. And so therefore, do you understand that it must happen? just as it happened, it must happen this way. Let's look further. For I want you to know that it must happen this way, for Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise. Beginning in verse 55, it says, At that time Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but... All this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Now Jesus knew that the scriptures are in fact the word of God. And being the word of God, he knows that God cannot lie. That his promises cannot be broken. And when the prophets spoke of the Messiah who was to come, they spoke because God spoke to them and God spoke through them. He opened up for them the things that no man could ever imagine, that God would come in the flesh to redeem mankind from the eternal punishment which our sin has earned for us. Notice again in verse 54 that he says that it must happen this way. It must happen this way because God's Word cannot be broken because God's Word is going to be fulfilled in everything that took place there at Calvary. It was all prophesied in the Old Testament. It was all the fulfillment of Scripture. We know that the Word of God is true, that there's not even a tiny bit of error in it. How many times do people say, well, I don't know that you can believe that book because it contains errors. And anybody says that to me, I said, show me. Show me. I've been reading it all my life. Show me where the errors are. You see, God cannot be even a little bit mistaken. Jesus says it must be this way. It's all been prophesied. I know what is going to happen. But notice the reaction of the disciples. It says every last one of them left him and fled. Every last one of them. You see, this was also prophesied in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. And Jesus had even warned them that that was exactly what was going to happen. You see, it must happen this way. Now, there are many people today who want to believe that it could be some other way. They would like to think that there are many ways to have a relationship with God, but Jesus said to us that He is the one and He is the only way. They'd like to think that man is the ultimate judge for himself as to what is true and what is not true, but Jesus said that He alone is truth. People would like to think that everyone who dies will somehow end up with eternal life in that place called heaven. But Jesus said that nobody comes to the Father except through Him. So in other words, if you miss Him, you're going to spend eternity separated from God. And the Word of God calls that the second death. 
You see, God's Word said that it must happen this way, that you must put all of your hope and all of your trust in Jesus, that you have to abandon all hope that you have, that you can be good enough to be acceptable by God. You've got to forget any idea that you may have that being religious is all that God requires of you. And you've got to reject the idea that God will see your sincerity and decide that that is good enough. Well, they may have been wrong, but they were sincere. But folks, always remember that to be, you can be sincere, and if you're wrong, you're just sincerely wrong. And you'll be wrong for all of eternity. So how did it happen? We know what took place. After the disciples had fled, Jesus was arrested and He was taken before the Sanhedrin, that ruling council of the Jews. False witnesses were brought forth, and even in their lies, they could not get their stories straight. And so it was obvious that they were lying. When the high priest challenged him and said, Tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus said to him, You've said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Now, folks, you know what blasphemy is? Blasphemy is to speak something against God. And he's saying that Jesus is claiming himself to be God. And so, therefore, it is blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered, He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and beat him with their fist, and others slapped him. Can you imagine? And they said, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? Outside in the courtyard, we read about Peter. Now, all the disciples have fled, but Peter has come to outside to where Jesus is, and he's warming himself by the fire. And we read about Peter denying our Lord those three times. We read about Pilate as Jesus was taken to Pilate, declaring him to be innocent and yet surrendering him to be crucified. And we find Jesus being beaten to the point just barely short of death. We find that he was made to carry a cross through the streets of Jerusalem to a hill called Golgotha where nails were driven into his hands and into his feet. And instead of anybody having sympathy for him, instead of anybody feeling sorry for him, we are told that the mocking of the crowd was as unmerciful as the scourging of the soldiers. Matthew 27, beginning in verse 39, it says this, And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The religious leaders mocking him, slapping him. The crowd mocking and jeering. Even the thieves. Even the thieves who were crucified, one to the left and the other to the right of Jesus joined in the mocking. The Scripture says that the robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Yet when one of them repented and said, Jesus, remember me, when you come in your kingdom, Jesus said, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me me in paradise. Then, at midday, the sun was darkened And there were three hours of darkness. 
and out of the darkness as Jesus bore the weight of the sins of all of mankind, our Lord Jesus cried out and said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Three hours when God pulled a curtain over His Son a curtain of darkness so that no one could see Him in that time. A time when the Father had to turn His very back on His own Son because Jesus was our sin bearer. And God could not fellowship with that sin. Can you imagine being alone in such darkness? Suffering the pain that He suffered? There was no mocking. There was no jeering during that time of darkness. For fear gripped the hearts of the people. And Jesus paid for our sins. Suffering. After three hours of darkness, light returned. The suffering continued until Jesus cried out, it says, in a loud voice and said, Father, into Thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, He breathed His last. Jesus said it must happen this way. Those who crucified Him, those that one that betrayed Him, certainly they were guilty before God for what they did, though it was prophesied that they would. And yet, we know that one of the first things Jesus said from the cross was, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Our Lord Jesus, the sin bearer, the one who suffered and bled and died in order that you and I might live and that we might live for all of eternity. Join me in prayer. Father, as we think about the horrors Jesus suffered. Lord, and for for Jesus, for you to endure that willingly. Because of that great love that you have for us, that you would lay down your life for us. It is difficult for us to imagine the horror of that night. Lord, we know that there is illustrated in that the great wickedness of man's heart. And Lord, each of us we know that in ourself that there is sin. We know that in ourself there was that judgment that was there. But Lord Jesus, You paid for the sins and You took our judgment upon Yourself so that we might be set free. 
I pray, dear God, tonight if there be anyone here that has never surrendered their life to You, never accepted that payment for their sins, that, Lord, they wouldn't leave this building without opening their heart. Lord, right now, if You've spoken to them, if You've spoken, drawing them to Yourself, that they would respond in faith, believing, accepting that payment, and committing their lives to You. For all who are here, dear God, that have already made that commitment, dear God, let us never forget the price at which our salvation was bought. Let us not be guilty of thinking that salvation is something that is cheap because it is free. Because, dear God, we know it came at a high price. Bless us, Lord Jesus, as we continue to worship You this evening. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, you are glorious.